By the way, have you used any of the of the techniques shown in this chapter? Uh, auto, yeah, I've done some of that in physics, in a physics context, like autocorrelation and uh, things like that, like you know, looking for looking at time series data. Yeah, because I was wondering, for the most part, if perhaps a, a more physical interpretation, it wasn't it easier to show in the examples yeah. instead of the more almost like signal processing examples. Yeah, I mean, also also used it. In, I've used it, for example, in music processing as well. So music signals, you know, audio audio signals, I should say. But I'm thinking about music, but audio signal processing, for sure. You use a lot of these ideas. Filtering, right? Filtering is a big part of it. I'm working on a, I'm working on another book called um, Electronic Music and Sound Design. We're using a lot of these kinds of techniques, but more detailed on the DSP than rather than on the digital signal processing, rather than on the, the probability theory underneath it. So. Is that also like a book lab or? No, no, that's just something I'm doing myself. Using some software called Max. You ever heard of Max, um, MSP, Max, Cycling 74 software, Max? Um, not really. It's a, for signal uh, audio, playing with music and audio, um, also for video too, but I only use it the, the, the music, music signal processing, they call it, part of it. It's really cool. Uh, you can draw, it's a visual programming type thing. So it's like kind of like connect little blocks together and things. It's pretty cool. Um, check it out. I know you're into music stuff, so you might be interested in that. How do you write it? M-A-X. Oh, It's built, it, uh, there's like a miniature, there's a, it's also part of Ableton, um, oh. DW, but you, it's, I mean, I'm mainly using it by itself, but. You type like max MSP, I think. Yeah, you'll. Oh, there we go. Section 74. Here, I'll post a link in the chat if I can find the chat. There it is. So it's like uh, a scratch, but for music producers? Yeah, pretty much. But it's really, hand, it's really nice. And you can uh, interface it with lower level code if you want code if you want. That's what I'm working on right now is this. Thing inside of it called Gen, where you basically write low level code, well, not low level, but like uh, per cycle, per sample, I mean, code is pretty fun. Pretty fun to manipulate things at the sample level. Although I've done it before with Juice um, with C, but this is a lot easier when you have all the GUI elements and you can just glue them together with little wires and stuff. It's awesome. It's not cheap, though. That's the problem with that. <laughs> Uh, it's not open source. Pardon? Is it not open no. source? Uh, no, there is a similar, uh, made by the same guy. Um, what's it called? PD? What's it called now? It's not PD. Pure data, I just call PDS. Yeah, something called pure data is an open source alternative to it that works very similar, actually. Well, I, I was checking it out right now. Yeah. And I thought it might be, it might be useful. I was trying to uh, to almost like build a, a MIDI guitar keyboard, but for the well for my laptop. Uh, but I didn't know how to do it physically, but this, this seems to take care Oh, this take will take care, care of that, of yeah, software for product. sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. No, it's very valuable. It's worth every penny that you pay for, or maybe, or if you can get it done with pure data, which probably you can, but. But they are, uh, all of these work with only low level programming languages, so. What do you mean? No, they're. Be, no, they're mostly this high level draw diagrams and connect stuff together type thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, you don't have to, you can write things in C++, C if you want to really go down to the, the lower level, but you almost never have to. Yeah, I wanted a good excuse to, to, learn, to learn Rust. I heard that a lot of things about that? it. But... So am I losing my network or did I lose you? My network sounds stable. Great.
All right, I can see you, but I can't hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Oh, now I got you. Yeah, I, my network just kind of went kind of screwy okay. for a minute there. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let's dig into the uh, random processes. It seems like kind of a strange term, but now I'm kind of glad they put this chapter in here because it is pretty relevant uh, and an important topic that often gets skipped over. So. Yeah. yeah when I was trying to Google some of the terms disclosed over here, uh, I think maybe a, a more general context of what is being covered is stochastic processes. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Maybe that's why sometimes. At least in this chapter, right? Many of the definitions, I mean, it's a bunch of definitions almost, except for yeah. the last part. Yeah. But it, there seems to be a higher motivation, at least in the stochastic processes part. Okay, so I'm going to start right, right okay. now. Okay, jump in. So this is chapter 10 of the, also the last chapter of the book of the book, Probability for Data Science. Uh, in this part, we'll be covering ra random processes and it'll always be almost like working with uh, a family of random variables that are indexed by time. So in that, in that sense, the author says that we are going to be modeling this random process as an infinitely long vector, but at least in, in more uh, technical terms would be just a family index by time, or when we work with the discrete case, it's like a, a sequence. So let's get to the first part, our basic concepts. Uh, for this random process, uh, the definition would be functions indexed by a random key. And over here, there is a nice example about it. We have some function f of t, uh, but is going to label the time, but now these values a and b, uh, they are actually random variables. So they are going to be depending uh, via this. I don't know, I would call it epsilon. I know it's not epsilon. I, uh, do you remember the name of this character? I want to say c, but I'm not really sure. Uh, well, we could use latex C5, right? I would just call it epsilon. No, E, maybe E. Uh, uh, let's see, what is it called? Yeah, it's Z, it's XI. Is the, yeah, XI. How do you pronounce that? Z, I want to say? Not like the letter Z, but. Uh, yeah, that's the one from the Riemann set of function. I, I think yeah. it is C. Okay, let's call it C. Yeah. So where we have our sample space, um, Taking some events, we can take note in the fact that these values a and b, uh, they are actually random variables. So if function f of t, it's also dependent not only on the time, but uh, it has some random component due to this part of here, the random variables. Uh, well, in this example, f of t represents a line. And if we uh, focus on some specific distribution for A and B, the random variables. The author proposes maybe a joint distribution for the pair A comma B. And these are their possible values in this particular example. And each of them has a probability one half of occurring. So the, well, the outcome of this function that depends on time uh, and this argument for the randomness, well, it would be just replacing the values. We can see over here. Uh, over here with probability one half and the other pair of values also with probability one half. But so the main takeaway is that the random process, uh, well, its elements are going to be functions indexed by a random key. They are no longer uh, real numbers, but they are now real functions. Over here, we have another example. And this is the point that I was saying. Uh, this mapping from X to well to this uh, specific event. Uh, usually, it is it produces a number because it's a random variable. But in this in this is context of random process, the output that is what we will be working with is actually a, a function, no longer just a number. So each random realization is a function. 
um, well, the randomness associated to that function, uh, well, it's specified uh, by the associated random key. That is, we are the random variables that we are using when defining such function, as we saw over here, the randomness of f is determined by the randomness of the random variable of the random variables over here, right? A uh, and B. So now, as we saw, we have a function of two arguments. One is deterministic, it has the time, but the other one involves randomness. So with those two values, we can uh, fix one and take a look at what happens with the other as it changes, and maybe then fix the other one and then take a look what happens with the other. So we can start via fixing some random key. So we are getting rid of the randomness, but now the time is what it is changing. So that would be a temporary perspective. And this would be expressed via this form. You consider these values when T is arbitrary, but this specific random key is already fixed. And if you can see it, that is simply a deterministic function evolving over time and we can study, study it in this way in a, in a discrete approach. Uh, the continuous approach, yeah, it's also studied but in a later part in this chapter. So just to emphasize that this sequence, this temporal perspective is deterministic. Uh, we have a sequence of numbers and we are simply a taking a look at how they evolve over time. And in the other case would be not to fix the random index or the random key, but to fix the time. So we can fix one time and then what it is changing is a random key. So the output that is the X of the G that is now a random variable. And <clears throat> in a specific case that the sample space is only determined, determined by this finite set of keys, then we can think of the sequence of time by fixing the time as this one. That would be a sequence of random variables where the only thing that it is changing is the event of the sample space. Um, yeah. ah, by the way, did you get like, uh, why there is so much emphasis in this part about the statistical perspective, looking at the, looking at it vertically, and the no, I I kind of I'm surprised that they, I didn't understand why they did that that way either. Yeah, I mean, I it was, it's like super super pandemic pandemic or something like that. That's the word I'm trying to think of. It's super um, drawn out, I guess. But maybe there's maybe it's a, maybe people who haven't seen this kind of thing before ever may have trouble with it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense with an image because it's just a, a slide, right? Vertical for fixing the, the time. But I know why he expressed this specific shape, right? Like this tower. Uh, I, I assume that he was referencing this slice as vertical or horizontal in the, in the grass. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, so now we define also the temporal average of a random process. So it would be simply this integral. Uh, we fix some random key. And so over here, it's just a deterministic uh, value. And now for a statistical average of the random process, uh, well, you would have to, to fix some t sometime and then associate it to such t the the other value sorry the other argument that is the she uh, is changing in the sample space so now you can consider the pdf associated to this random key she and simply integrate this expression and it makes sense because it's like the expected value of x at t because x at t is a random variable so it has its PDF. It's, it's a usual one that we have already been working with. Um, an interesting part is that this distinct type of average, that is the temporal average, and this 
uh, well, statistical average. Well, in general, they are not related, but under some certain conditions, uh, each one of them does tell you information about the other one. And um, we take special uh, emphasis on those cases because they are easier to work with, at least mathematically. And the conditions are this one over here. The, the temporal average is constant and the statistical average is also constant. Uh, in particular, if they are the same value and they are also zero, then this random process is known as ergodic. And we can approximate the statistical average using the temporal one. Okay, so or here is an example of this. Uh, we have some discrete random variable. This is its PMF. As we can see, it's just a Bernoulli, Bernoulli distribution. And we define this random process. Uh, well, n will be changing. Uh, it's, just, it's just going to be an integer. Well, uh, probably a positive integer. Yeah, a positive integer. And this is just a, a random variable that we are working with, where uh, she can be either plus one or minus one. Now, wait, is it she? No, I think G is in one. No, sorry, A of G, sorry, it's one or minus one. Okay. So we can take a look at the statistical view that was fixing the time. So in this case, it would be fixing this uh, M value. And over here for the expression, we will have A of G. It's simply A of G. But now, because A of G is Bernoulli, sorry, it follows a Bernoulli distribution, then we know uh, how its values are uh, occurring and with, and with what probabilities. And its values would be simply one with probability one half and minus one with the same probability. It's just a Bernoulli random variable. But now for the temporal view, that is we fix the random key, then we can change N as a, as a positive integer. But now, if A is one, then we simply replace in the formula and we're here similar for minus one. And now what we are obtaining from this temporal view is a time series. Uh, and I think most of the applications in the, in the last part of this chapter are related to time series. Okay. So, how can we generalize the, from, sorry, the, the concepts that we have already been working with with random variables? Now that the output is not always a random variable, it's not always even a number, but sometimes, well, it, now it is a function. So again, it's mostly like taking a look, sorry, uh, of defining these concepts, but at a specific instance of time. So we're going to define the mean function of this random process xt. And it will be this function as well, at, that at the specific time t, where is the expected value of this random variable, x of t. <coughs> or here is an example. We can define the random process where this function a, uh, well, it follows a, a uniform distribution or from the interval from zero to one. So what would be the mean, uh, the mean function of this random process of this X? Well, it's simply the expectancy at this specific point, sorry, of the function at, uh, at this specific time. We replace this. Now this is constant cos of two pi t. So we can take it out and then the expectancy of the random variable A, well, it's expectancy of, related to the distribution and, and that would be I think one no one half one half one half so now simply the mean function is one half of cosine two pi t okay 
Now we can do something similar about the correlation of random variables. In this case, because for each t, we are generating a random variable where from this specific random process, then we can take two different instances of time and from those possibly different uh, random variables, look at how they are correlated. So because they are taking part, sorry, because they are generated from the same random process, we call this autocorrelation. And the definition of this autocorrelation function is this term, and that just simply is the correlation of these specific random variables generated from uh, the random process evaluated at some specific times, t1 and t2. So again, it's another type, it's another type of slice. In this case, I guess it's a two-dimensional temporal slice or something. So here it's a nice example about it. We have theta that follows a uniform distribution from P to P, and we find the random process that would be like a signal received, well, probably the simplest signal, but over here, this argument, I think it's called the phase, I don't remember. For theta, it's actually a random variable. So by definition, what would be the autocorrelation function? So we fix some time T1, T2, and we calculate the correlation between these two random variables. Uh, and just simply from, from the, well, from the usual definition, right, of an expectancy, we perform the calculations. And the interesting part is that, and we, I don't want to, spoiler, I know that is mentioned yeah. uh, a little bit later. Yeah? Yeah, good. I was just laughing because you said that word, you don't want to have a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a, uh, I think it was called pipelets, something like that. That we can see over here for this function. Yeah. Um, again, and now these autocorrelation functions, it tells us the correlation between the function up to different uh, times. Um, let's see, what's for this? Ah, yeah, well, the spoiler was, <coughs> sorry, and uh, write an expert, so it wasn't really a spoiler. It's just that uh, for this autocorrelation function that we just saw, uh, well, it has a nice property that it is completely defined by the, uh, by that, by the interval between, well, by the interval produced by these two times that we are taking a look, that is by this difference from the first time to the, to the next one. Uh, and when, and the author mentions this that this autocorrelation function has a top list structure, but at least when I was uh, searching about what is a top list function, I, I think it's not defined, but uh, the context where it is used is for a top list matrix. So a little bit later on, we see that from this we can consider a discrete case, and in such a discrete case, construct a, a matrix that represents the behavior of the random process in a particular interval of time. Uh, and now it's such matrix that represents this in the discrete case that has the web list structure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not uncommon though to, to consider the continuum limit as it were and call that a toplet structure. Even though it's not a matrix anymore, it has that structure to it. But this is, yeah. Also, okay. you could say it's time invariant, I guess, but, but yeah, in a continuous case. Yeah, I, I wonder why he didn't say that. Time translation it, invariant. <laughs> it makes much more sense. Uh, now we can also define the covariance. In this case, it would be the auto covariance function. And again, it's a similar case for, uh, for the, uh, for what we have already seen for random variables, but now we have the random variables uh, constructed by taking a look at a specific time. So 
Uh, it's quite clear. And just a little theorem uh, that relates the autocorrelation, no, sorry, the autocovariance function, the autocorrelation, well, and the mean function. And again, the proof is quite simple. I guess it deserves like a, a like a reassurance that it is the definition that still are still making sense. Uh, they are still compatible with with what we have already seen when just focusing in random variables. Um, now we can also define the correlation, sorry, the cross correlation between two different random processes. So now. The, these times are being evaluated for different random processes and similarly across covariance. Uh, I don't know, too many definitions. I know, right? And you're like, some of them seem unmotivated and then they, later they use them like, oh, okay, now I know why you brought that up. Yeah. So independence, again, it's just a simple generalization. For two random variables, we saw that they are independent if the PDF satisfies this. And so we expect the same for these random processes. But um, the way to formalize such concept would be, well, this formula over here, I don't want to read it. But the important part is that this factorization that we saw over here, like we can split it, uh, it has to hold for any number of intervals that you or sorry for any number of specific times uh, at which you're considering your random process and where it's small or large so it's quite a big or a small factorization um the main idea is the same then independence means that the behavior of one process does not affect the other one and we simply define two random processes to be incorrelated if this equation calls, and still we have that independence of random processes uh, in place and that they are correlated, but not the other way around. So, so really it's only from this part over here that things start making a little bit more sense. Well, after we go up to all, after all the definitions, this part, but at least it's a, a good like blend of the tools that we have already been working with because uh, again, convolutions appear and the Fuller transform and all of that. So we will be focusing in a very small subset of possible random processes, but at least they are the ones that kind of arise naturally. So they will be pretty useful. So we find a white sense stationary random process xt if its mean function is constant for all t. And, and well, what you said, right? That the autocorrelation function is time invariant. So it depends uh, over here, I think, or here. It only depends on the difference of the times, not in the specific times themselves. And we can see or here this second remark because these WSS processes can be characterized via the interval of time, not the time itself. Then we can define these functions not not only via two arguments, but now via just one. That would be the interval, sorry, the temporal interval size. So we can rewrite this as the correlation function as via this form. Um, now, for this specific, uh, sorry, for this special case of autocorrelation functions, some nice properties appear. Uh, well, this one, I think it never comes up. I think, well, actually, I think none of these come up. Do you, do you remember? I think, yeah, the R of zero part comes up in the average power when they do. Um... When they mentioned it in the Fourier transform part, um, I think it's related to that anyway. Well, this explains a little bit uh, in a later definition. I, I remember this, I think now. 
And the final one, I'm using not a word. So a physical interpretation of this at the correlation function whose only argument is the uh, temporal interval size. One could estimate uh, the cross correlation function. Well, that would be a spoiler, sorry. So one could define this expression. Uh, it's almost like a convolution, but in a finite interval. Uh, of these values, um, this whole effect is averaged over, over the domain. And there would be a temporal average of this product. And the interesting part is this, one, this, this lemma, that the expected value of this temporal average is precisely the autocorrelation function. So an implication would be that if the signal of the random process is long enough, then it can be approximated via this temporal average. And over here, it also comes up that due to this expression that the correlation, autocorrelation function now takes in, uh, you can see that it's almost like a convolution is taking place. And yeah, it actually is taking place because this, the, well, this, uh, temporal average is just the unflipped convolution or the correlation of these two terms. And here is a little graph that is, where image explains it. And really, is that there is a small difference when some values are being calculated, but that the output is the same. So it, there is really a convolution taking place. Okay, so now we define the concepts that will be, now this one over here, over here, this will be the useful ones for the later applications. And it's, it's almost like an analogy of how you can get, a, at least in the continuous case, a probability via integrating some density. We will also work with some density related, related to this uh, WSS process. Um, and also what is the output that it's being generated once you integrate a, a certain density function. So from this point forward, we will only, we will only be focusing on uh, weight sent stationary processes. So we will also be going to assume at least for the Fourier uh, techniques to be used so that they work, that this autocorrelation function is square integrable. Um, there is this concept of the power spectral density of a WSS process that it is still not defined in this part, but it, it will turn down to be precisely the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function. So, over here, we delve uh, a little bit into what is this power spectral density uh, and what is its integral measurement. See? There, is, there was some weird, weird noise, so I, I, I got. Yeah, I got that too. Okay, so seems good now. Um, well, just a small thing of where are we focusing in this uh, WSS scenario? Um, well, because it, as I mentioned before, from the autocorrelation function in the discrete case. Uh, there will be some matrix that can be generated. Yeah, over here, it's going to be generated, this part. And the idea is that you can use, sorry, you can decompose such matrix. Uh, well, he says, in a form that the eigenvectors 
are the Fourier basis. So it's like the necessary condition for Fourier techniques to work for the specific matrix that we will be, no, sorry, for the specific matrix that we want to diagonalize. diagonalize. So this is what I mentioned also before. So if we take a look at the autocorrelation function and it, uh, at defined, sorry, by two uh, specific times, T1 and T2. Well, this time, these two times define uh, an interval of time. And such interval, we can consider um, a, dis a discretization of it. So that is what is being done over here. And in, in such a discrete case, we can, for example, think that it is being split such interval into n parts. And then we're simply referencing which part of that interval that has been split, split okay, are we considering. So we can do that via these integers, m and n, that they are simply changing from zero to n minus one, depending on, on which of the sub intervals are we considering. Uh, however, because we are dealing with a WSS process, uh, again, this, fun this autocorrelation function depends not really, not necessarily on the specific times, but really in the in the interval size. So we can even, uh, now that we have discretized it, we can even just use one argument. In this case, it would be one integer, uh, depending, sorry, for, for this specific function. Uh, and that is uh, uh, what I was saying as referencing which part of the subinterval are you taking in. So now that you evaluate it, considering those specific intervals from zero to n, n, n minus one, well, you get this matrix. Um, and what they mean that this matrix has a to a this structure, uh, it's basically this diagonal. Well, mainly I think it has to be symmetric. Yeah, and that this main diagonal, okay, all of its terms are the same and they are constant. I guess so it does came up what you said because the value of zero is constant. Okay. So then uh, some Fourier transform can be used in order to diagonalize this matrix. Um, Well, over here is not, but but they will be very useful in order to to find some specific a uh, minimal no sorry optimal functions in order to minimize some error, well, most likely related to a time series that we want to the filter the noise out of, out of its data. So we can define the cross power spectral density of two random processes. And over here, there is uh, a little bit, well, there is some importance between this uh, non-commutativity because you can define this cross power spectral density for x, y, that would be the Fourier transform of their uh, cross, -correlation, uh, cross correlation function. And similarly, uh, well, this this function, sorry, this density, but now with the order, now with the different order, y x, and now also this function can change. So in general, the densities can be different. Uh, this is one of those definitions when I was reading through. I'm like, what do we need this for? <laughs> and that I guess he does use it later in the uh, linear transformation part, but. Yeah, I think he uses this, this part. Yeah. Uh, well, and this, and this is a part that, uh, as soon as I was reading this, uh, I thought, oh, so possibly this makes more sense in physics because. Yes. It's like, yeah. Because he's talking about power, which is not really, you know, which is something that comes out of physics, right? So. So what are you usually, uh, like, you physicists? Uh, 
usually measuring over here with this xd that it needs to be like if it's the voltage for example the voltage squared is the power in a you know electronic circuit is the most common example right mm -hmm. and voltage squared over the resistance but i mean basically proportional to voltage squared right that's the common that's the 99 percent common example interesting so when well, the definition is simply we have a random process and now we can consider this almost like a temporal average but now of this x squared term okay. and once it is being normalized with respect to the domain size we have this expression that would be the power uh, we, no i think that's not the power i think this one okay but then this function it also has it's random yeah yeah so in order to to get rid of that we can consider uh, and also it's not considering the whole the whole random process because time is supposed to be possibly changing from zero to infinity so where well, we can take the limit of this integral and to get rid of the randomness simply take the expected value of the random variable so now that would be the power of the random uh, process. And um, now from that, the power spectral density can be defined. And that is the one over here. The limit as t tends to infinity of this term that uh, again it, it came up from, from normalizing an integral. And um, now the expected value that we are considering is now the Fourier transform of the random process that we were working with. So, I, I mean, the good part is that all these ugly definitions, in the end, they become nice uh, for the WSS case. And, and this is a part of the analogy that I was mentioning is that we have some density. And um, once you integrate it, you get another important function. And over here, we see that uh, the density, sorry, the integral of this power spectral density function, well, that's just simply the power. And over here, it's emphasized that the power spectral densities are function whose integration gives us the power. Um, and for our case, these densities, at least, they can be obtained from the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function. And that's a result that's used all the time <laughs> in signal processing. I mean, yeah, for sure. OK, so over here is the, the the definitions so uh, so that we can make sense of how this sort of well up to this point there are only definitions but how how these concepts actually get applied in the real world and we consider uh, an, a scenario labeled labeled as a linear time invariant system or LTI well and as you mentioned it seems to be using signal processing communication speech analysis and imaging I think there was no imaging example right I, I was mostly excited about that one yeah there's no imaging example uh, yeah but but there are there, there are imaging examples it's used quite a bit in image processing too just in yeah. you know two dimensionals that's all there, there was one part I think when he's comparing a, a type of filter to rich regression where th there was some term that he used for, ah, yeah, convolutional maintenance. Yeah. I think at least when I Google the, those, uh, they are used, right, in imaging like yes. for kernels and for such. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so probably that was almost like an example of that. So, okay, so uh, a brief overview of what are LTI, uh, linear time invariant systems. Well, supposedly, supposedly there are a function that if they take an input, and generates an output. But the important conditions is that uh, this process has to be linear in the sense that 
if this input produces an output y and if input x2 produces an output y2 then after scaling those then the output should also respect a uh, such a scaling so almost like a linear transformation uh, and then the time invariant part is that the shift in the input random process uh, produces the same shift for the output so the shift is preserved um how does it how does it relate to what we have just been covering is that for these lti systems the relation between the input and output it can be given by a convolution and in this case for this formula right for this convolution from the input to the output then this term this term over here uh, is what it would be the system response or the input response Okay, well, well, we already saw <clears throat> the Fourier transform. Yeah. Uh, just for a reminder, if you have this convolution, then once you apply the Fourier transform, then uh, the output and uh, the operation becomes a product. So now our input response is Fourier transform takes on this form. Um, what we will be working it is that the input for our LPI. It's going to be a WSS random process. Um, the output is, being, is going to be generated by sending the input, the random process from LPI system. And I think we will see uh, three or four of those. So in order to take some measurements related to these uh, LTI systems, we, uh, we will work to define some terms and uh, let me see. And it's not necessary to define, they have already been defined. Uh, well, it is just a simple term. What is the expectancy of the output if XST is a WC random process? Uh, well, its mean function is going to be constant. So really the expectancy is mostly going to depend on the impulse response. Over here. Uh, what would be the autocorrelation function of this output? Again, uh, the proof is quite simple. Uh, it's going to take on this form and obviously related to the autocorrelation function of the input. So now, how does this uh, concept of power spectral density relate to these LTI systems? Um, we can see it from this theorem. So we have our WSS random process is being filtered via some LTI system that produces the output Y. So the power spectral density of Y, that is the term over here, is going to take on this form. So again, uh, the filter, the, well, sorry, the input response function is not what comes up over here, but it's Fourier transform, and then it, it is to be, uh, like measure, so like taking the absolute value and scoring. I think over here there is an example, uh, not yet. Oh, I will tell you something. So again, how do how do the previous concepts relate to this? Uh, I yeah, you're here, but you mentioned that it is being used. Okay, so for two random processes, xt, wt. A, we're going to say that they are jointly WSS. If they are individually WSS and the, their cross correlation, no, sorry, the, no, yes, the cross correlation function a, takes on this form. So it's it just a, a function of this a, difference. So again, as we use for the autocorrelation case, then we don't need the two specific times, but just the interval size, sorry, the time interval size. And again, simply, I have been writing the definition for the expectancy. 
then simply simply a lemma for the cross correlation between two random processes that are that join the WSS. Now, how are their cross correlation function re uh, related? Um, again, the H term, H term appears via the convolution in this case of, of the autocorrelation function. And now similarly, we can define the cross power spectral density of this joint the WGSS. I expected now the good part to come, but I only see your and definitions. Well, let's see this theorem uh, connecting the cross power spectral density. And again, a Fourier transform has taken place uh, for the input response. And maybe let's, maybe let's look at the next one and there's not much thing. So at least let's let's finish with the best part that okay. in this case, they were the applications. So the optimal linear filter, uh, we're going to be taking a look for these first two examples uh, for the discrete case. So we saw how we can change the model of the random process to discrete. Uh, it's already been shown when we constructed such matrix R. So really, yes, there is a, a slight change of implementation, so, but, we, but we don't have to go over that. And now the problem, right, that we are working with well, it's called optimal linear filter design. And um, all we want to do is that our input is corrupted. And we're assuming that the random process is some time series. And we simply want to filter the noise. So in order to conceptualize this process of like cleaning the data or filtering the noise, then we can model a, that the output that is a, the data that has been clean. Well, it has a, this type. It has this type of relationship. There is a, a finite type of convolution via this uh, input response and the input. And of course, we expect some. Uh, sorry, there is a call. Okay, some error associated to this model, but we are going to be working with this convolution as our predictor for the output signal. Uh, of course, we want our, our predictor to match the ideal, sorry, the ideal or the real uh, function of the, of the input that we are getting. So in order to do that, we have to minimize this type of error. We simply square it so that uh, we get some free differentiability. And again, because we're working with a random process, if we want to make things simpler, we can take just an expected value. In this case, that is what they are doing, and now we want to minimize the expected value of this type of error. So now simply a problem of filtering the noise of our input, eh, eh, it has been reduced to minimizing this expression over here. And the solution, it does come up, eh, well, deterministically or in a simple fashion, eh, via this equation. So over here, there's simply the model that we have been working with, the predicted eh, output, it has a form of a convolution of the input in order to filter the noise. There is, of course, some error term, uh, but uh, let me see over here. But the solution that we want, the, this optimal minimizer for our linear filtering problem, uh, it can be obtained deterministically from, uh, well, this matrix equation. We have the uh, cross correlation then the discrete matrix that we have defined. So it's just a typical linear algebra really. 
Uh, let me see if this is a regression. Mm, I think this is. Uh, well, we're going to apply this to uh, what is called the autographic process in the sense that each value at, at the instant of time is depending on the values prior to it. So in this case, uh, such relationship would be modeled via this equation. There is some com final convolution of this. And again, the predicted value is depending on the previous ones. Again, there is some error term, but we simply want to minimize the expectancy of this error. So we simply replace uh, the X with the Y in the previous formula. And what do we get? In this specific case, do we get the, uh, I know, I thought there was like a, a nice formula because for the next ones, there are. I don't, yeah, I think you just have to solve it um, like using least squares or. Well, at least for the simulated example in Python, yeah, uh, we see that it did work. It managed to to retrieve where well, to filter the noise. Yes, yeah. So over here we have another type of filter. In this case, it's also discrete, but now we are not working with a finite case, but infinite. So really, it's yes, uh, countably infinite. So now the sum turns into a, a series, but again we can consider as a type of discrete convolution. Uh, over here, it's a similar relationship. The output is some convolution of the input, and again, there are some error terms. Uh, of course, this the, the equation that we saw before for Jules Walker, it doesn't hold because, uh, well, I think there are in matrix for infinite dimensions, maybe tensors. I don't know if they, if they count as infinitely dimensional matrices. Do they? What do you mean? I'm sorry, I didn't understand that part. Uh, can tensors be considered, well, sometimes, uh, infinitely dimensional matrices? Well, sure, you can have infinite. Yeah, you can have, I mean, tensors are just generalizations of matrices, but that's in terms of dimensions, like, um, like 1D, 2D, 3D. But you're talking about infinite components, I think is what you really mean here, right? Yeah. It's like an infinitely large matrix, but you can work with infinitely large matrix. Ask uh, talk to Heisenberg; he did all the time. <laughs> okay, but how? In the quantum mechanics uh, case. But are they different? Sorry, are they infinite in all directions or only like? I mean, because I'm trying to visualize it, and I don't know if it's like is it like a no. He means like if you have like a three by three matrix, that's a, certainly a two dimensional matrix with three components in each direction, right? So I think you have ten by ten. Yeah. 100 by 100, and you can think of an infinite by infinite one in the limit, right? That's what they mean by there in terms of that size matrix. So it's a 2D regular ordinary matrix, not a tensor, but it's just, I mean, it's a tensor rank too, but it's um, have infinite number of components, I would say. I don't know if that's the precise correct terminology, but that's what I'm thinking of anyway. That's what they mean here. They mean it's a very, a, you know, infinitely large matrix. I mean, you can just think of the limit, like K goes to minus N to N, and there, in that case, you just have a matrix with you know two n components, and then go on from there. But yeah, or two n times two n components, but numbers, right? Mm, okay. I don't know if that helps at all, but that's. <laughs> I don't mean. I, I, I was trying to visualize it, and I didn't quite get to it. Yeah. But at least the most part it has quite me to visualize it because the math works. So again, the convolution. It turns into a, a, a Fourier transform and it simply comes up yeah. the formula that we have already been seeing. But now the filter, uh, well, it does has a, it does have a closed form and that, that is simply the inverse. We yeah, the Fourier transform of this expression. Well, I, I like this example, but I think there's really not much time, so. Um, I can finish. Over here, for example, they are applying this 
Weiner filter to the analysis function where the gray uh, the gray graph is a no, the in, noisy input. I it was pronounced Wiener. We're not sure Wiener. That. that could just be. But I'm not 100% sure about that, but yeah. Okay, so the Wiener filter uh, uh, prediction for the output is this part in, in red. And as we can see, it does a great job. Kind yeah. of matches the, the real uh, output. And over here, there is simply a, a what do you say? Delta function. A graph of the filter. Of, the filter oh, yeah. of course, yeah. it's, also, it's also defined for every real, but we only need it. Uh, we only need it for the specific interval. And uh, well, there is also an example where you your input uh, has involved some convolution, but now you want to undo that process. Um, over here, it's also completely solved. So, like there is a closed form for the for the for the sorry for the filter function that you want. Um, as we can see over here, it does not match as well as the other case, but also because I mean the the transformation of the input it was a little bit heavier, so it makes sense. But still, there is quite a match between the black that is the ground truth, truth and the winner filter uh, predictions. Um, well, there is an important caveat in this part. Uh, at least in real life, we don't really know what is this. Uh, uh, well, I think what's called density power. I think PSD, this PSD. At least this part for the for the error terms, it, right. it can be estimated via the samples, via this, but the other part no. And um, it Almost like we saw for bias that tends to involve that we have also some really some prior knowledge of what the distribution or how the output should look. So in this case, in that case, it can work. And also they mentioned that this winner, sorry, winner fil filter, a uh, it's just a generalization of rich regression because if you do the same model uh, that we saw, there is some convolutional metrics that arises. Um, but in the end, the solution provided by rich regression, it takes in the form as a solution produced by this ultim optimal linear filter, but for a specific case where this uh, where this happens, so this term does not affect the value, and this error density, sorry, this density of the error happens to be constant. Ah, that was it. Ah, uh, yeah. What follows is just proof, but now they are not important. Okay. Do you want to add something more? No, I think um, I think you did a good job uh, with that chapter. I mean, it's a, it's a challenging chapter to try to squeeze into an hour, but we both read it and we both went through it. So I think that um, you know, we we. We, we can we individually covered more of it than you could cover in one class um oh hey we did it we got through the probability theory book even though we left left some people behind you and i persevered and got through the yeah. whole thing <laughs> we did it so i mean i, I'm I did, glad I did that, find it worth it yes yes I mean, it was definitely worth it. I'm glad glad to have gotten through that book. And I know that I won't retain all of it, but I will. And I've seen a lot of these things before and I didn't retain them the first time. So every time you just have to keep going over the, this stuff over and over again, and you're gonna get that right now because you're taking a class. So that's great. So you'll get to reinforce these things. It'd be awesome. Uh, me, I'm probably gonna forget a lot of this, but hopefully I'll get to use it again soon. <laughs> and remember it, but yeah, yeah. it was fun. Yeah, I really need the parts about the imaging filtering. So uh, at least uh, very soon, I think I will be able to place a, a couple of things from the book. Cool. 
Yeah. So I appreciate you sticking it out with me. I know that it was a challenge because you already have a couple of the book clubs starting. And uh, it was a challenge for me to have two other book clubs that are still going on. So I'm waiting for one of those to wrap up and then I'm probably jump into something else. But for right now, I'm trying to keep my book clubs down to two with my current plan. Will you join the, the Julia book club? That one I do. Yeah, I'm hoping that one won't start too soon. Has he put out a call for that yet? What's it called again? It's called... Uh, um, uh, numerical FNC. computation yeah. with Julia, is it? Yeah, FNC book club. What's F stand for? Fundamentals of numerical communication, yeah. Every time I see FNC on my list, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> but yeah, I guess he hasn't put out the call yet. As he says in, in May. Yeah, will... that's perfect timing. I think May is going to be good. I'll, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. I want to learn how to use a Julia. It seems really promising for um, for data science since everything is in, in, immediately compiled, so to speak, or I guess actually is immediately compiled when you um, write your Julia code, but it's like writing Python or R. It's like um, at a high level. So that's kind of a nice system there. So I did do a little bit looking at like there's a they have a machine they have a, a probabilistic um, Bayesian library called Turing I think it's called that looks pretty interesting too that I want to learn so yeah it should be fun I don't think that'll be part of that book club but just things I'm thinking about for using Julia for yeah when I had to learn it well I didn't have to but I wanted to um, it did feel like the best, the best combination between Python and R. I think mostly are. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it was quite worth it, but uh, like it's not still quite popular in the marketplace for that. Yeah. Time, so so I, I, I restricted myself to continue to learn. Oh. But it's so good. But I don't know. It doesn't seem worth yet. No, I, but I just want to, I mean, it'd be fun to just dip our toe into it on this, in that, and then also review some and learn some new numerical computation stuff at the same time. So it seems like a good way to do it. Yeah, well, I think most likely uh, see you in May. Um, that's for me. I, I have nothing else to add. What's that? What did you say? Uh, I think see you in May, probably okay. in, the, yeah. in the Julia book club. And yeah, absolutely. Bye, yeah. bye for now. Okay, yeah. Thanks again, Lucy. Uh, Lucy I appreciate it. Thank and, you. Uh, see you in May. <laughs> Unless we don't see you sooner. All right. Bye. Bye.